We just need to get this uh, PowerPoint to that. Can you? Is it off mute? We'll come up in a, in a minute. Let me just say, uh, in, in the meantime, what a privilege it is to be here with this distinguished group. Um, I'm very grateful to uh, Shalem. Uh, organizers for inviting me. Uh, it's also a very moving experience to be here. My grandfather was a great um, Zionist rabbi under Hitler in Berlin, uh, and it's my first trip to Israel, and it's long overdue, so I'm very grateful to have that opportunity. Um, Monty Python uh, programs used to have this segue, and now for something completely different. I think that uh, that is has never been more apt at a philosophy conference in my experience. Uh, I'm, I'm here maybe as the sole uh, person whose AOS is not just philosophy of a contemporary sort, uh, but also philosophy of mind um, and cognitive science. So, so really what I'm going to present is, uh, is a very different animal. Ironically, I just finished a book on human nature uh, called Beyond Human Nature which is not out yet, so I have, I, I have a lot of um, views about the main themes of this conference. Uh, I also, my, my last book was on on Humean ethics, so I have views that connect up with a lot of the, the, the themes that have come out in the talks already. But I'm going to talk instead today about uh, Locke and not Locke's uh, moral philosophy, but Locke's philosophy of mind. So it will, it will really, are there any philosophers of mind here, people whose primary area is philosophy of mind? This is great liberty. I can say absolutely anything, um, uh, and no one will correct me. Um, okay. So, just get this up and running. So, really, what I want to ask is, is whether Locke's views, as charted out in the essay, are plausible against the background of contemporary. Uh, thought in, in philosophy, but especially in, in cognitive science. Um, we're having technical difficulties. This is the problem of, depending on technology, we seem to, why, uh, here we go. So why do history? Um, there are lots of reasons to do history. I don't need to you know, tell this group why they should do history. Obviously, it's intrinsically interesting. I, I think one reason to do history is a little bit like why you should watch foreign films. Um, not to impress uh, women, but, but um, because foreign films are better. And they're not better because they make better films in countries other than your own. Foreign is, after all, a relative term. It's just that foreignness is a filter. So if you look at the films of France or Italy, for instance, uh, two of the great filmmaking countries, the majority of them are utter crap. But the ones that actually get subtitled and imported into your country are the ones that are very good. And history is that kind of filter. 400 years from now, when we read 20th century philosophy, we'll be convinced that everybody was like Wittgenstein and Quine. You know, it's not tr true. Most of them are sort of schlumpy, mediocre philosophers like us. Um, but the filter of history will give the impression that there were these great figures. And I, of course, our, our reading of the historical past in philosophy is um, benefiting from that, um, that filtering advantage. So I do think the figures we read are better, by and large, than the average philosopher we've come across today, so they're, they're, they're worth reading for that reason. But they're also, I think, interesting to read in terms of their contemporary relevance, and that can manifest itself in two ways. If you want to kind of explain how we got here, tracing the history is important. Um, but one might have another view, a view that's sort of fallen somewhat out of fashion, um, which is that the figures of the historical past in our profession are developing ideas and theories that might be true and worth consideration in the contemporary context. So, you know, there was a period in doing the history of philosophy where people like J.L. Mackey would write a book on Locke that was really just a, a thinly veiled attempt to advance his own uh, theories. I'm going to do something kind of grotesque like that. Um, full disclosure. I don't have any difficulty advancing slides here. This will work. Okay. Um, now, empiricism is clearly a live option that, that, in the sense that that term is frequently used in contemporary philosophy. Uh, so, for example, in epistemology, there's quite a lot of talk of, uh, about empiricist theories, um, empiricist theories of justification, for instance. Uh, there is quite a lot of work in metaphysics that draws on the empiricist uh, tradition. For example, uh, certain theories of uh, causation are said to, to have their origin in, in Humean thought. Uh, in ethics, maybe most obviously to this audience, there are a lot of people who 
uh, find inspiration in the, in the uh, Anglo-Scottish tradition for uh, contemporary moral philosophy. Philosophy of mind, though, has been less clearly uh, connected in its contemporary form uh, to work in empiricism. And um, what I wanted to ask is whether the Lockean way of ideas is actually defensible in the contemporary context, whether there is anything to contribute. And in doing this, I'm not going to engage in the scholarly exercise of trying to attempt what seven things Locke meant by the word idea. So I'm going to be a little bit fast and loose, more than a little bit fast and loose, uh, with some of the Lockean constructs. But I want to point out that some of the, some of the main themes in Locke's discussion of ideas are widely recognized, or widely, I should say, widely believed, because recognized as factive, to be problematic. So already dating back to Berkeley, we, we see real concerns about the Lockean notion of abstraction, which is central to his idea, his theories of idea acquisition. Locke has some views about, um, about how ideas refer, which I think have uh, sort of fallen out of uh, discussion, which are, which are worth uh, bringing back into focus. Um, Locke's maybe most enduring um, uh, contribu contribution in thinking about the nature of ideas, uh, though there were precursors, of course, is that ideas are grounded in the senses and sensory experience. And there's this kind of copy principle that you see again in a new way in, in Hume, that ideas are stored records of perceptual states. Now, it's almost axiomatic in contemporary philosophy of mind that that's, that's just plainly false. It's a non-starter. The idea that thinking can be grounded in stored experiential states is, uh, to say the least, out of vogue in contemporary uh, philosophy. It's the centerpiece of Locke's uh, empiricism about ideas, and that's something I want to spend some time with. And another centerpiece that's equally out of vogue is the first book of the essay, where Locke uh, rails against nativism. And the innateness hypothesis is really the central, maybe even the, the seminal, the founding principle of contemporary cognitive science. So it would be heretical in the contemporary context to say that Locke may have been right about this, but, um, but philosophy um, banks on occasional heresy. Um, so what I want to do is cycle through these, these central constructs in, in Locke, again, not doing the scholarship, but talking about whether they have contemporary viability. Now, the, the Berkeleyan critique of abstraction, of course, centers around uh, Locke's puzzling, almost paradoxical quote where he says that the general idea of a triangle must be neither oblique nor rectangular, uh, neither equilateral nor equicurial nor scal scalin on, uh, but none in all of these at once. So he's sounding very Heideggerian here. Um, and one wonders what, what the uh, frig he could mean. And, um, and of course, both Hume and, and, and Barclay uh, lock onto this. Um, is abstraction a viable? construct in thinking about the way the mind works. I think that there is something to this paradoxical construct. I'm not at all sure that it's what Locke had in mind. It's probably not. But there's something to this in contemporary thinking about the way perception works. So for example, if you just take Marr, David Marr as, as a representative of a contemporary vision science, the basic organization of the visual system seems to involve a process that's very much like abstraction in, in, this, uh, in the sense implied by the quotation. So for Marr, there's a progression from a very piecemeal representation of the visual stimulus uh, to a more organized representation that bounds, binds those pieces together into coherent boundaries, separates figure and ground, gives you a sense of, of, uh, of dimensionality. But there's a final stage of processing that abstracts away from a lot of surface details. And generate some sort of representation of the underlying geometrical structure of the objects we perceive in a way that um, is indifferent to a vantage point. So a dog presented from different orientations would generate the same sort of volumetric representation of the thanks of uh, of the object. And to that extent, is this is this working? Yeah. Okay. Uh, to that extent, we seem to have. A, a presupposition of something like abstraction in a, a, in a language that's sometimes used in this context, these representations abstract away from metric details, which is to say a triangular shape presented to the retina would not be represented as having angles, interior angles of any particular size or proportion at the highest levels of vision. They would be abstract representations in Locke's sense. 
And I think this raises an interesting question, which is there is a scholarly debate about whether Locke is an imagist. And I think one reason why the majority have dissented from that view is because the account of abstraction suggests that ideas are not simple pictures in the head. But if we're not ascribing imagism to Locke, then what exactly is the view? And this has left people with a puzzle. It doesn't look like there's a positive alternative to imagism that can be stated in a kind of empiricist way. And I think what we see in modern vision science is a kind of solution to this puzzle, which is that we can, we can attribute to Locke the view that what we get in ideas is some modality specific form of representation. That is, the format of thinking is the format of the senses. Every representation used in thought is, in, is originally indigenous to the senses, is borrowed from the senses. But the sensory specific representations are not mere pictures, they're more abstract sometimes in the way these high level visual representations are. Um, so is Locke an imagist? I think we may, maybe need an expanded vocabulary to think about sort of sensory specificity in thought without getting locked into this somewhat restrictive term imagism. Um, just one more slide on this. Just this is a typical kind of, of stimulus set used in, in neuroscience where you find, for example, that the cells in the visual system of a monkey are indifferent to vantage point across a range of rotations. So a face presented from different angles may cause comparable activation in um, individual neurons within these higher visual structures. So there's some sense in which the visual system is abstracting. It's not quite Lockean. Locke says abstraction takes effort. He says it's unique to humans. It brutes abstract not. Uh, so I'm, I'm not suggesting that this is what, what Locke was actually doing. But what I'm suggesting is that this idea that's been written off as almost unintelligible in Locke may actually turn out to have some contemporary validity. With respect to reference, I want to draw attention to two tenets of, of the Locke and psychosemantics. Um, one is captured in this quotation. So uh, Locke says, ideas distinguish the qualities that are really in things themselves, the reality lying in that steady correspondence they have with distinct constituents of real beings. But whether they answer to those con constitutions as to cause or as to exact resemblances, it matters not. Here's an allusion to the primary secondary quality distinction. It suffices that they are constantly produced by them. So in this, we have an account of mental states of ideas according to which they represent not by resembling the world, though some of them do. They represent by their steady correspondence or their constant production by, uh, by the objects out there in the world. And a second feature of the Lockean psychosemantics is captured in this idea. Locke says that ideas of substance have in the mind a double reference. One, they sometimes are referred to a supposed real essence of each species of things. And two, they som sometimes they're only designed to be pictures of those qualities that are discoverable in them, uh, a, a idea that he, he uh, labels nominal essence. So the idea is that our, for, for each idea of substance, you can talk about the way it depicts the world, its nominal essence, the way it presents the world to us, and the real essence underlying that image uh, that it tracks out there in external reality. And I think this sort of duality in, in Locke's semantics in certain ways prefigures Frege, but Frege, of course, is very anti-empiricist insofar as he thinks nothing in the head can give us account, an account of how we, how we grasp concepts. Uh, so I think it's, it's worth sort of seeing, seeing Locke as a nice alternative to the Fregean uh, tradition. And I want to see whether this idea of double reference has contemporary relevance um, let me say first with respect to the idea of steady correspondence that the mainstream philosophical alternatives for explaining reference, mental reference in naturalistic terms are distinctively Lockean, which is to say if you look at contemporary philosophical thought about how reference works in the mind, the, the dominant ideas, and I won't survey them here, but the dominant ideas uh, involve uh, the supposition that something in the head is able to refer to something out there in virtue of bearing some kind of causal, informational, teleological, it's going to depend on the theory, uh, real, um, connection to some external class or property. Uh, so to take one formulation, you might say mental states refer, refer to those things um, that, they, that reliably cause the mental state to be activated or tokened in the mind. And that idea of, of reliable causation, central to contemporary semantic thought, 
is, I think, a, a descendant of the Lockean idea of steady correspondence. So to that extent, we see Locke's ideas alive and well. Um, we also see analogs of this idea of double reference. And here I would refer you uh, not to philosophical work, but to psychological work. Um, take, for instance, the, um, the, thought, the ex thought experiments turned into real experiments by the developmental psychologist Frank Kyle. Kyle asks children um, to consider the following case. Imagine an animal that looks like this, that gets painted black, a white stripe is painted down its back. These very smelly sacks are tied under its fur, so it creates a terrible smell when you approach it. And at the end of this transformation, it looks like this. Children are then asked, tell me, is this animal a skunk or a raccoon? Now, if we go by nominal essence, if we go by appearance alone, we should say it's a skunk. But children um, from kindergarten, um, a bit older than kindergarten on, start to track that actually this is a raccoon. It's just a cleverly disguised raccoon. Our capacity to distinguish between appearance and reality in this respect, and to track some underlying reality that might um, be misrepresented by appearance, suggests that we're keeping track not just of nominal essences. We sort the world not just in terms of appearances, but also in terms of real essences. So this Lockean duality is in place there. Another feature of the Lockean semantic program in this, in this regard is our ignorance of real essence. So Locke thinks that our uh, concepts of substances, our ideas of substances, refer to real kinds in virtue of their steady correspondence with them, but we don't know what those real kinds are. And you can see this again coming out in psychology. This is from a study by Dan Simons and Frank Kyle. And what they did is they asked children to consider um, an imaginary case where they're told that there's a space crocodile who comes down and has x-ray vision. And the, the crocodile looks at all of these different objects in the world, and he can see straight through the surface to see what's inside of them. And uh, they're shown pictures like this, and the children are asked, well, which one of these is the real sheep? Which one, and, and one of them you can see has sort of machine insides, and the other has more organic, animal-like insides. And they did this with photographs and jars of, of uh, gears and, and um, anatomical models, all kinds of ways of doing this. Um, the, the basic finding is that children, this was four-year-old children, um, were terrible at answering this question correctly, which is to say they did not systematically, only uh, half of them or fewer at younger ages, virtually none of them, reliably identified this as the real sheep suggesting that children are sort of indifferent to the inside. They don't really know what makes a sheep a sheep. They don't know what distinguishes an animal from an artifact. When shown artifacts like cars and asked what's on the inside, children were only slightly better. They're pretty bad. Kids just don't know that there's like soft, mushy, gooky stuff inside living bodies. But their answers were systematic in the following respect. They tended to give different answers for machines and for animals. So we don't know what makes these things real. We don't know what the essence of a sheep is, but we know that it differs from the essence of a car. And to that extent, we have an awareness that there are real essences out there, but we don't know what they are. It's a very Lockean idea. And I think you would see this borne out in adults. Some of us are a little bit better at our sort of talking about the, the real essences of things and will appeal to genes, but I don't think any of us in this room have a, a particularly good grasp on what it would be to identify a sheep genome or distinguish it from some other creature, nor do many of us in this room have a distinctive view about whether it's genetics or, say, clades that are essential uh, to, uh, to species. So I think all of us walk around with some sense that there's something that makes a, a sheep a sheep, but very little idea of what that is. And this is something that's very central to Locke's thinking about this. He writes colorfully about it just to, to give one um, sort of representative uh, example familiar to every, everyone here, but, but uh, charming in, in Locke's, Locke's naive appropriation of, of anecdotes from travel logs and, and hearsay. Um, He's describing our inability to determine whether a chimera, a chimerical creature, is really a, a person. So is a centaur a, a man or is it a horse? The fact that we don't know this suggests we don't know what the real essence of man is. So here's another example. Uh, had, the upper to middle, had the upper part to the middle uh, parts of some creature been a human shape and all below a swine, 
uh, had it been murder to destroy it? Would it be murder to kill a creature that was half human, half pig? Um, or must a bishop have been consulted whether it man enough, as I've been told happened in France some years <laughs> since? So apparently there are man pigs in France next time you, you know, eat, uh, eat pork in, uh, I'm sure there are not many pork eaters in this room, but if you're eating pork in France, be warned. <laughs> um, another feature of Locke, and this is really the one I want to spend most time on, is this idea of modality specificity. So the idea that we, we think using a code that is borrowed from the senses. Um, now, there are various reasons why one might have rejected this view historically, but what I want to try and argue is that it's something that we should keep on the table as a serious option when thinking about the mind today. One argument for it would just be a kind of parsimony argument that goes like this. Suppose we have this uh, theory of reference that I mentioned before, the kind of Lockean view according to which there's a steady correspondence between a mental representation and some class of things out there, and that's how the mental representation represents. That's how reference works. If you have that view, um, you need an account of how a concept in the head is able to be caused by something out there in the world. And presumably, presumably the only way an object out there in the world, like, a, like this little chihuahua, can cause something to light up inside the head is if you perceive it with your senses. So the content-conferring relation that exists between a mental representation and an external classification um, depends on a sensory intermediary, depends on being able to perceive these objects with your senses. So once you admit that you need some way of reliably tracking features of the world with your senses, there's a kind of uh, parsimony argument that says, well, why not let these stored records that are doing the semantic work stand in for your concepts? Why not let them function as the basic building blocks as thoughts? Why not let them be, in Locke's terminology, the ideas? So that's a sort of simple argument. But I, what I want to really look at um, there's a brief survey of, of evidence from psychology that supports the idea that people think using sensory-specific codes. So um, just to give an example of some of this research, this has been a recent trend in psychology. So in the last few years, there's been a sudden excitement about resuscitating these central strictures of empiricism. Um, so one kind of study, um, this one by Stanfield and Zwan, involves um, reading sentences to people like this. So Mary pounded the nail into the wall. Some subjects hear that. Some hear Mary pounded the nail into the floor. The sentences are almost identical, just a different word at the end. After reading the sentence, subjects are given pictures. And they're asked, did the sentence mention the depicted object? So did the sentence mention this? Trivial answer, we can all say yes. But the manipulation is that half the subjects see a horizontal nail, and half of them see a vertical nail. And you'll notice that if you think about Mary pounding the nail into the wall, if you imagine what that's like, it will be horizontal. The nail will be presented horizontally. If you imagine Mary pounding the nail into the floor, you'll imagine it vertically. If people are comprehending sentences by forming corresponding, corresponding sensory images, you should see a facilitation effect. They should be faster at recognizing that the nail, of th that this object was represented in the sentence when the sentence they heard is about the wall, they should be faster for the vertical one if they heard the floor sentence, which is just what the psychologists find. A lot of studies like this coming out. This is a much easier object to identify than that one. They're both depictions of a, of a moose, but in, in a, just a, a control condition. People are faster to recognize this picture than that picture. But if you give people a sentence in advance that says, through the fogged goggles, the skier could identify the moose, and then you give them some pictures to, to identify, they're faster at representing the blurry one than the clear one. And the effect, of course, goes away if you have them read about clear goggles. Um, suggesting, again, that sentence comprehension involves some sort of recourse through imagery. Uh, this is another study where subjects are presented with a rotating spiral, and then they have to um, read sentences like this and indicate when they've understood the sentence. Now, in this case, the spiral gives illusory movement. It looks like it's moving towards you. And if that movement is, is um, consistent with the sentence being read, like the car approaching you versus leaving you, there's again a kind of uh, facilitation effect. Um, another kind of experiment using, uses uh, what's called switching cause. So suppose I have you attend to sound. I say, listen to the tone of my voice. And you're focusing just on that auditory dimension. And now I say, well, attend to the movement of my hand, and you move to the visual modality. 
that's a slow switch. Going from hearing to seeing is slow. But if I say, attend to the movement of my hand, and then I say, attend to the color of my shirt, you're pretty fast at doing that, because that's moving from vision to vision. The question is, does this arise in a conceptual context? And what uh, researchers have found is that, in fact, it does, even for extremely familiar objects. So is a blender loud? This should be a trivial question. In psychological lingo, it's an overlearned question. We're so familiar with blenders that it's trivially easy to answer this. We shouldn't need to go through our senses to answer it, but it looks like we do. So when asked, is a blender loud, followed by do leaves rustle, we're pretty fast at that second question because it's another auditory question. But when we go from is a blender loud to our cranberries tart or our lemons yellow, a gustatory question or a visual question, we slow down, suggesting that we're using, again, a sensory representation to answer questions even about familiar objects. Um, you can show that if you interfere with abilities to use our senses, you get degraded performance. So consider questions about vision, a lemon can be yellow, uh, or questions about audition, a blender can be loud, being asked while you either have to store pictures in your head or keep tones in your head, a melody in your head. People are, are show degraded performance for questions about auditory features if they're keeping music in their head and degraded performance for visual features if they're keeping pictures in their head, suggesting that we need to use these visual resources to answer cognitive questions. You can look in the brain and you find when people are looking at pictures of objects and reading names of objects, you see similar neuronal activation, and the activations are in areas of the brain associated with perception. Um, in fact, if you look at the brain and try and identify some place where there is non-sensory representation, it's very difficult. You may have read in your textbooks in, in a secondary school that if you, if you discuss the brain at all in your biology classes, that cognition is in the frontal cortex. In the frontal cortex, you might think, that's where abstract conceptual thought takes place. The senses are in these more posterior areas. But all this gray stuff up here, that's where thinking takes place. But if you look at what goes on in those areas, and I won't go through this in detail, you basically find very little evidence for anything like an amodal system, an engine of thought in the frontal part of the brain. If you find anything up there that, um, that looks like it's, it's uh, special, you find structures that are called working memory structures that are used to orchestrate sensory areas of the brain during cognitive performance. So you don't find amodal representations. You find control structures for using modality-specific representations throughout the more cognitive portions of the brain. And you find the whole brain active in the context of cognitive performance. When should I stop, by the way? Because we started late, so. OK, good. Um, so the, the interim upshot here is that I think there's, there's no um, demonstrative evidence that I've been presenting for the view that we think using sensory images. But there's a lot of suggestive empirical evidence that's consistent with the predictions of the empiricist theory, which is to say, what I'm not doing here is giving you anything like a conceptual analysis or a, uh, a deductive argument in the philosophical sense for the view that we think in sensory terms. But I think in, it's consistent with a certain kind of Lockean approach to figuring out how the mind works that we use our best observational evidence now that has expanded to include the, uh, the evidence from experimental psychology um, to test predictions about the mind. And what we find when we do that is that the Lockean suggestion that we think using the senses actually retains a far greater degree of viability than a uh, textbook introduction to psychology or cognitive science might have led us to believe, far, uh, far more than we would find in a textbook introduction to philosophy of mind. Um, so the predictions of, the, of this kind of quasi-imagist view seem to be well supported. Contrary to the prevailing view, I think if you want, to, if you want the, the dominant view of how the mind works as understood by philosophers, you might look to the work of this guy, uh, Jerry Fodor, um, whose view is in a certain way, despite his book on, on Hume, uh, the antithesis of empiricism insofar as he thinks um, that cognition is couched in a kind of mental language, a language of thought that's utterly removed from the senses. So Fodor would be, would be um, outraged at this kind of view. I think the evidence presented is actually evidence against the Fodorian model of thought, so we'll make Jerry frown. A <laughs> um, couple more remarks on this just quickly. I, I think that there is a reason 
why the empiricist program as understood as a modality specificity claim is considered a non-starter. And that reason has to do with abstract concepts, not abstract in, in the Lockean sense of abstraction mentioned before, but abstract in the sense that there are certain concepts for which there's no obvious picture to be drawn. Um, our more lofty or advanced concepts seem to, seem to be incompatible with sensory representation. So just a couple of remarks on this to give a flavor of what contemporary research on this problem might look like in a way that's consistent with empiricism. So one might wonder how do people think about causation. Um, Locke uh, has a few things to say about uh, causation. One of his um, refrains is that when we think about causation, we have no concept of causation itself. So here he uh, he is anticipating Hume, uh, we can't understand what that specific relation is that is causality. But we are aware of effects. We can observe uh, a cause and its effect, and we can represent the causal relation by just storing that relationship. Uh, so if you see an event like this, you might say, well, I observed the cause, the movement of one ball, and the effect, the movement of the other ball, and that's how I represent causality. I don't need to do anything further. I can pick up instances of causality through my senses. You can do it statistically. There's a lot of work in child development looking at how children are pretty good at uh, statistically picking up causal relationships. So if you show, for example, that when you put a cube on a box, the box makes music, and then you put a cylinder on the box and nothing happens, then at test you put both the cube and the cylinder on the box and music comes out. And now the question is, what should we say about these two objects? Do they both have the power to cause the music or is it just the cube? And kids realize that it's just the cube, even though the cylinder occurred here in correlation with the music. Why don't they attribute causality to the cylinder? It's not constant conjunction. There was an instance back here where the cylinder occurred in the absence of music. So they, they're tracking constant conjunctions here in order to attribute causality, a sort of Humean notion, but also one that I think uh, is consistent with, with Locke's basic approach. Another thing that Locke says that um, is uh, important for understanding the empiricist approach to causation is that causation is related to powers. And um, it's, uh, Locke's discussion of powers is, is notoriously obscure in various ways. But one aspect of that notion of powers that might be worth resuscitating, and this again comes out in, in a couple of passages in Hume, is that we have a certain kind of embodied recognition of forces. We can push and pull things and feel things pushing and pulling against us. One thing we might be doing in attributing causality is projecting the feeling, these embodied feelings of pushings and pullings out onto the external world. And there's a whole battery of new empirical results that are consistent with this. So for example, when having to push a lever uh, in a psychology experiment, when you're, um, when you're instructed to push the lever when you've understood the sentence, um, if the sentence is, Mary closed the drawer, people are quite fast. Mary opened the drawer, people are quite slow. If now the response involves, um, uh, sorry, that's pushing the lever. If the response now involves pulling the lever, you're faster at, at, at recognizing or comprehending sentences that are consistent with that motion towards the body. And you can even show this in abstract, more abstract representations. So one event causing another um, seems to trigger a bodily response consistent with a sort of motoric action of a causal kind, suggesting we understand the power to, of one thing to cause another by physically instantiating it. And this plays a role in sentence comprehension. What about mathematical concepts? Um, you know, Locke is interesting on this because uh, in subsequent work it, it became clear that, that math might be problematic for empiricism in various respects that I won't go into. Kant's uh, famous remarks on this, for instance, are, are worthy of study. But for Locke it was obvious that number was available to us in the senses. And to a certain extent this is right. So if you look, for example, at work in developmental psychology, you see that even very young infants, infants of about five months old, are capable of keeping track of basic numerosities. And not just infants, you can find this in, in, in rodents, you can find this in birds, there's even some evidence in insects. If you present sort of one little doll and then raise up this uh, occluder and then put another doll behind the occluder, then you lower the occluder, kids correctly predict that there will be two dolls there, not, not one. So they're keeping track of numerosity. And you can see how the senses might do this. You store in memory a record of 
the one doll, then another doll is introduced, so your, your mental image contains two dolls, and now that's your expectation for the future. And so this is very consistent with the Lockean notion that number is obvious and given in perception. But Locke says something else which is interesting, quite interesting, I think, in the context of the third book of the essay, where he seems to say language plays a purely expressive role in thought. When it comes to mathematics, Locke thinks language also plays a cognitive role. Language doesn't just express our ideas, it can embody our ideas. He thinks that we use verbal labels to name numbers, and it's only in virtue of doing that that we can keep track of very large quantities that outstrip our perceptual apparatus. That's exactly what we're finding in cognitive science. So for large numbers, we, for, for exact thinking about large numbers, you see activation in language centers damage to those structures of the brain or interference with activity in those structures degrades performance in the mathematical context. So uh, Locke's, Locke's sort of um, remark on this is that without such names or marks, we can hardly well make use of numbers in reckoning, especially where the combination is made up of any great multitude of units. When we get into large quantities, we need to use symbols and thought. That's consistent with the contemporary um, uh, work in this area. A moral concept, I'll, I, I won't, I, I, could have given a talk on this. I'll just say Locke, I think, um, doesn't say enough about where moral concepts come in sensory terms, but Hume may get this right. All of the recent research is pointing to a link between moral concepts and emotion. That is, when people make moral judgments, and I won't go through the studies, you systematically see activation in areas of the brain associated with emotion. If you induce emotion, you can affect people's moral judgments. So if you're given a question like this, Frank's dog was killed in, by a car in front of his house, so he cut up the body and cooked it and ate it for dinner. How wrong was that? Most people think this is pretty wrong. But if they're at a very dirty desk, they think it's even more wrong. So give them a greasy pizza cart and a Slurpee container with caked on liquid, a chewed up pencil, and a snotty tissue, suddenly Frank eating his pet dog becomes a, a much more monstrous act. Um, you can show that elimination of emotions, as it happens naturally in psychopathy, leads to a degraded comprehension of the moral domain. So uh, uh, here's a, a statement about psychopaths from one of the world's um, uh, experts on it, Kirby Cleckley, who wrote a, a classic study of psychopathy, saying, goodness and evil have no meaning to the psychopath. It is as though he were colorblind, despite his sharp intelligence to these aspects of um, existence. The explanation is that Psychopaths lack standard emotional responses, and their failure to be able to see the world as enraging, as shameful, leads them blind to the moral domain. On moral development tests, they come out in what's called the pre-conventional stage, meaning they recognize that some people think certain things are wrong, but they don't understand why they're wrong, suggesting that the Humean empiricist picture is right and will make Hume smile. Let me say, just I'll end in one second, I just want to say one quick remark about innateness because this would, would also be, be a talk in itself. Um, uh, let me just skip this point about abstraction. Um, innateness, I said, is the, is, the, is the prevailing view within cognitive science, but I think it's a prevailing view based on um, what, what Locke is, would characterize, did characterize as a certain kind of laziness. And it's not to say that the developmental psychologists and psycholinguists who have done work in the nativist voice are, are lazy in the sense of not working hard. It's just that they've stopped considering learning as a serious explanation. Developmental psychology is no longer the study of development. It's the study of what we already know. And um, if you actually look at the studies, those nativist conclusions are not at all borne out. That is, just about every cognitive capacity that we find in strikingly young infants, we fail to find in infants who are just a little bit younger. So there are developmental trajectories. And some of the most classic experiments within developmental psychology that have been used to advance a nativist position are utterly unconvincing on scrutiny. So for to, just two quick examples of this, in one famous experiment by Kelman and Spelke, infants see a rod moving behind an occluder like this, then the occluder is removed, and they either see a, a whole rod, a whole object, or two rods that happen to be moving in unison. And judging by their looking times, the experimenters infer that the kids are very surprised to see this one. They stare at this one much more. And they say, kids understand this physical principle of cohesion, and it's innate. If you look in, in, in younger infants, infants under a month old, you see this in three-month-olds, they don't show the surprise effect. You also find lots of evidence that as kids get older, seeing a more complicated object 
is more interesting to them. So they stare even just in the baseline condition, older infants stare at this one more. So the interpretation of this as innate knowledge as opposed to something that's learned or an artifact of visual complexity is, is a terrible leap. And you see these leaps throughout the child development literature. One more example and then I'll stop. Um, here's, here's a study trying to show that kids understand psychology. They attribute mental states. So in the experiment, um, the infant spent some time seeing a ball roll down a plane, leap over a barrier, and hit another ball. Then in the test condition, they either see a ball that, now the, the barrier is removed, they either see a ball that leaps randomly in the air, even though there's no longer a barrier, or a ball that rolls along a straight trajectory. And the kids, like adults, are surprised if the ball leaps in the air, even though this is more perceptually similar to what they were looking at in habituation. So the researchers infer that kids are actually attributing a desire to this ball, or an intention, the desire of the red ball to make contact with the blue ball, and they attribute rationality to it. They know that a rational agent will go the shortest route to make contact with its goal. That's quite an intellectual achievement for, in this case, a 10-month-year-old infant. And again, interestingly, younger infants don't do this, so there is learning going on. But even this interpretation of the results is problematic. So for example, if you look at this habituation, it's a ball hugging a surface. It's moving along a surface. And um, in that respect, this display is actually a lot more like this display, because the ball just stays along its surface. Here, leaping into the air, where there's nothing below it, is very, very different from that display. And in addition, this is a much more familiar experience. Kids have lots of experience of balls rolling on surfaces. So this is a totally uninteresting stimulus. And you can see this again in the baseline conditions. The fact that they stare at this one longer is not terribly surprising. Um, I'll stop with that with respect to the um, experimental evidence. And let me just draw some conclusions. Um, what I'd like to suggest is that if you survey contemporary cognitive science, um, we are really in the grip of a nativist language of thought, computational understanding of the nature of mental life. And I think that itself is rooted in various historical facts that have to do with things like uh, the computer revolution and Chomsky's revolution in linguistics, but it's a, it's a resounding victory for the rationalist tradition as read uh, by the orthodox views, the textbook views in cognitive science. I think the empiricist tradition has been written off prematurely. And we're now in a position to, I think, go back and read these authors uh, from the uh, Anglo-Scottish tradition and find in them resources for developing a new and testable theory of the mind that may turn out to be superior to its uh, alternative. So the Lockean ideas about ideas retain uh, currency and empirical support. And if right, the prevailing theory of thought needs to be rethought. I think that um, to understand human nature, too, to get back to the theme of the conference, we benefit from moving away from this nativist dogma and trying to think about the mind as essentially a perceptually grounded learning machine. If we think about the mind, and this is a central, almost moral theme in the first book of the essay, as something like an empty cabinet that's capable of being filled and filled differently through the course of experience. Um, we might end up with an account of the human mind where human nature is fundamentally characterized in terms of flexibility. We are by nature unnatural insofar as in contrast to the brutes, we're capable of adapting our minds in ever and unboundedly novel ways. So I'll end on that note and we'll make Locke smile. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse. That was wonderful. I, I did look forward to it. <laughs> um, I have a question for you about some of your last remarks on nativism. Um, is it really possible ever to know, especially with such young children, uh, whether what's going on is learning or a certain, as it were, timed uh, kick in? Uh, function for some some part of our mechanism. So, I mean, uh, without knowing much of this literature, as I understand it, the sort of old Piagetian story is about a lot of our development is that there are certain things that just kick in at various times. So, if you're finding that 10-month-olds do X and 8-month-olds don't, 
could mean that the eight-month-old is learning something in between. It could also mean that it take, it's 10 months when that particular piece of the brain starts, starts acting. Um, are there experiments to try to differentiate between those two? Um, yeah, I mean, lots. I mean, for, first of all, there's a theoretical point to make, which is that the, the sort of blue ribbon form of a nativist argument, the best kind of nativist argument, is going to be a poverty of stimulus argument. And the structure of a poverty of stimulus argument says that the stimuli to which a child is exposed um, are insufficient to account for the resultant state. So the end state cannot be explained by a combination of general purpose learning principles together with the history of the child's experience. In so far as the major achievements that we've seen in uh, the conceptual domain, including things like a mastery of the basic physical concepts that we can observe in the world, are not amenable to a poverty of stimulus argument, the in principle reason for defaulting to nativism that's been advertised in psycholinguistics is not even applicable to this domain. So it shouldn't be our default view. But that said, there is the, always the possibility that this stuff is innate, um, and it would be worth trying to test it. I do think what we want to do are two things. One is actually look at the learning trajectory in, in uh, combination with um, looking at what children are exposed to. And there are a lot of training studies that can do this in the lab. It's very hard to do that over biographical time. But if you do it in the lab, where you expose the child to a bunch of new stimuli, you can actually see learning taking place. And there are lots of studies that, that, um, that take that form. But another thing you can do is modeling. So you know what in the predictions out of your model, and then see whether you're seeing that in, in the infant's behavior. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Uh, thanks for the talk, which is great. Um, I, I wanted to uh, 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 to begin with to to, to take on uh, the uh, the David Marr vision thing that you had mm -hmm. here. Uh, I, David David Marr does something that's sort of uh, conventional in the last thirty years, which is to say, um, we're interested in knowing how vision is processed. So what we do is we we uh, we begin with a certain kind of uh, uh, a certain level of vision, and then we develop it up, develop it up to an abstraction. Now, presumably, if you take Maron vision and you construct something similar for other you know, for, for other senses, right? If you you'd have an audio one, mm -hmm. and then you'd have a tactile one. And the problem with it is, or I guess some people see this in a, as an advantage, is that in each case you end up with this very abstract thing built into what's being called a, a vision system, uh, which fits really well with you know, sort of post-Chomskyan um, uh, modularity theses where absolutely everything is a module. Like mathematics is done by an independent system and vision is done by an independent system. Everything's an independent system. Um, the problem with it is, uh, well, there's lots of problems with it, but one of them you could say is, is this terrific redundancy. If if vision can get you all the way up to abstract ideas, and then your audio, audio system can do it, and so can everything else, then you, what you've got is essentially a whole bunch of little brains, each one abstracts, you know, I don't know to, to what level. Um, for Chomsky, that's fine, and for the, the whole school that says, really the mind is a whole bunch of different, almost independent processors. When, when we look at Locke and Hume and, and, and the tradition that we're looking at, um, their um, their hostility to innateness um, is linked, I think, to uh, a vision of the mind where the mind is kind of, is is a general purpose processor. I mean, the, the assumption that uh, what we know and what we can do comes from learning sort of seems to I don't want to say it entails, but it seems to be um, related to the idea that the mind. Um, uh, is a general purpose learner, that it can learn all sorts of different things and not just specific things. Whereas the innateness uh, model um, tends to lead you in the direction of saying, well, if it's all pre-programmed anyway, so, you know, evolutionary, every time we run into a problem, we can pre-program, we can have an additional uh, adapted module that takes care of all sorts of specific uh, circumstances. So the, the question I want to ask you is, is um, is there in this sort of um, neo-empiricist neo uh, revival that you're either describing or, or urging, uh, or both, 
um, is there something that addresses this other very basic question, not the innateness question, but the question of whether whether models such as locks and humes, which are general purpose learning models rather than, than domain specific, is there any interest in that? Do you have any interest in that? Or is that just sort of yeah. irrelevant? I, I, sh I should say first, I, I'm an opponent of modularity, but modularity kind of properly defined would be a thesis about what information can get into the senses and what to what degree senses can talk to each other. Um, and I think that there's tremendous amount of communication in all directions within the nervous system. Um, I believe, however, in, in what's sometimes called domain specificity or functional specialization, which is to say, I do think the senses do redundantly encode information. I think that we can see, for example, in the nervous system, there are multiple maps of space. So, for example, you have an auditory map of space that allows you to locate a sound on your right, and a visual map of space that allows you to uh, focus on the on the right side of your visual field. And you need both of them because you need to coordinate these two input systems. So, if I hear a voiceover in, on to the, my right, now I want to shift my eyes there and take in a visual input, and I want to bind that voice to whatever the the moving lips are in that vicinity as opposed to th this vicinity. So, intersensory integration requires some redundancy in the sense of being able to map one uh, onto another. We see characteristic breakdowns where people lose a, a capacity in one sense while retaining it in another that's suggestive of this kind of specialization. Um, what about higher level? Well, like, likewise in the higher level. Planning. Uh, well, fig when we get into higher level cognition, I think the empiricist tradition gives us uh, more than one story. So people associate uh, associationism with empiricism, and this was certainly central to Hume and, and, and to Mill to some degree, but certainly in Hume uh, and some of the, the, the followers. I, I think you don't see it as clearly in Locke. I mean, Locke is skeptical of association. He talks about association as misleading us, becoming sick when you see the color yellow by association and things like that. Um, and Locke, you know, and some people say Locke is a, is a you know, quasi-rationalist or proto-Kantian because he talks about the faculties of reason. Um, I think that the empiricist tradition, broadly speaking, is a faculty psychology tradition. And our cognitive functions can be characterized in, in, in this specialized way. The idea that all thinking is based on a single, a single operation um, get some voice in the tradition, but it's not the only idea there. The contemporary analog of that would be behaviorism or some branches of connectionism. I don't I, I mean, in a certain way, I want to plead uh, a, a neutrality about it. I don't think we've seen enough from those traditions to be confident that we'll get a theory of thought that postulates a single rule of thinking. At the very least, we can acquire new rules. At the very least, you can develop a very specialized procedure for dealing, I mean, the same way you can learn a recipe, you can learn a very specialized procedure for performing a certain kind of cognitive operation. When you learn long division, that's what you're learning to do. So even if we start out with some general purpose um, cognitive operation, specialization is an, is an outcome of, of learning. At this stage, I don't think we're in a position to know how general purpose we are in terms of the basic operations of the mind, um, though I think that should also be an active area of, of research. If it turns out we have some fair degree of specialization operations, it's not a funeral for, for empiricism uh, because I think Locke, among others, has a view that looks like that. Um, I, I just say I have uh, 15 more questions <laughs> on my list, so um, let's keep, I don't and know, I'll be, 10 I'll more minutes, quick in and uh, so please keep uh, the questions short. Uh, just very quickly, I'm, I, I don't understand uh, the, the use of, ch the appeal to uh, experiments concerning children. I mean, what is it supposed to show? I mean, why is it important? I mean, that. I mean, you said, well, they don't actually study development. Yeah. Um, and then in response to a question, you said, and they don't actually do any experiments to discover whether it is development or, or, or whether it's just uh, a capacity that uh, is acquired with age. So, so what are these, the people who, who do this childhood <coughs> experiments with children, of the sort, and you mentioned several of them, um, what is it supposed to show? I, the, one of the buzzwords in developmental psychology these days is core knowledge, and um, one of the dominant uh, aspirations of developmental psychology is to show that infants already know stuff that we know. 
when we develop looking time paradigms, these ways of inferring what infants think from how they stare, it was a window into the infant mind unlike anything we'd had before. And the, the, the really exciting outcome of that research is that infants were doing more psychologically than we thought. You know, young, you know, infants before three months are really like lumps. I mean, those, you know, those of you who are parents know this. I mean, they can, you know, they can hardly hold their necks up straight. Um, and you know, the idea that there's very complicated mental processing going on is, is really quite surprising. One of, the, one of the first discoveries is that infants co-classify triangles. So going back to abstraction, you know, it's a pretty interesting thing that infants can take triangles that look all different and co-classify them. How do you show it? Well, you give a child a series of very different triangles and watch it get bored. And then you stick in a square and it gets excited again. Now, that suggests something about what the infant is thinking. That's a, that's a revelation. So I think developmental psychology in terms of revealing what infants can do cognitively is a very illuminating science. Um, that particular feat, learning to classify triangles, was not taken when it was first discovered as evidence that there's an innate triangle concept. Rather, it was evidence that the sensory apparatus that children have can pick up on certain real regularities in the world and that this might be learned. In fact, we have models, very simple artificial neural networks, that can do this kind of classification too. It's a pretty trivial thing once you understand how the mechanism works. It really was, I think, dogma inspired by Chomsky that led people to start interpreting results of that kind as evidence for innateness. Ironically, if you read the journals, a lot of the, the reported studies look at different age groups. So they'll look at infants at two different age groups, and they'll show the, the uh, headline effect in the older group and not in the younger group. But the discussion at the end of the paper reports this as evidence for nativism. I mean, it's, it, as a philosopher reading this stuff, it's often astonishing what a leap there is uh, from from data to to theory, and I think those those leaps are indicative of a certain kind of uh, bias in interpretation. So I think developmental psychology, as as the experiments are actually conducted, are well positioned to shed light on the question of learning. It's more in the reporting of those studies that the nativist picture rears its head. I was uh, I've never been clear on how the contemporary nativists, Chomsky and whatnot, are actually in conflict with someone like uh, Locke or Hume. Uh, Locke, Hume are going to get down to some hardwired tendencies, and it's an open question uh, how robust those are going to be. When they're attacking innate ideas, well, Hume doesn't do it, but when Locke is, he's attacking uh, the notion that our mind innately grasps mind-independent eternal truths. and uh, he's saying, no, we, we don't grasp these truths that way. Um, but there could still be robust mechanisms of the mind that, that are there that explain how we end up with what we have in our mind. Uh, and I've looked at the, at, at the nativists, uh, contemporary nativists, they're not claiming the sort of thing that Locke is attacking. They're not claiming anything about mind-independent truths. They're just saying we have more stuff that's hardwired whereas other people say maybe we have less. But how is that debate uh, really engaged with the debate Locke was interested in about whether or not we grasp mind-independent truths? Um, I, I mean, you know, Locke, of course, is provoked by pamphleteers who are saying there's innate knowledge of, of the Christian God. He's thinking that people going to the Americas, finding cultures that don't uh, obey these precepts are in, you know, are somehow subhuman or immoral because this knowledge that's been written in the soul by the finger of God and hence available to them is it is ignored or they didn't have it in which case their status as human beings is called into question. So he, there's there's a lot on on the line here and and he also is a is a kind of normative rationalist insofar as he thinks such truths need to be bolstered by 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 reason. Um, that said, Locke's official position is not just that there are no, no innate principles, um, but there are no innate ideas. The discussion focuses on universal truths on, and truths of external reality, but his bottom line conclusion extends to, to all principles, whether contingent or universal. The universal truths have greater claim to innateness because a lot of the arguments for innateness build on the self-evidence of those particular, um, those particular judgments. So I, you know, I think the official Lockean view, though motivated by a, a narrower concern, 
is more radically anti-nativist than, than what we see in contemporary cognitive science. Would Locke reading Chomsky be especially bothered by this? Well, you know, not, not in the moral sense, but I think he would see, and I, again, I'll again you know, use the, the word laziness that he uses, I think he would see in this program a tendency to try and explain something um, in the vacuous way of saying it's already there. Now, you're right that we might get to a point when we're, we're pushed to that. Hume says on principled grounds that the sensorium is innate. The, the basic building blocks of the senses are innate. Um, even that's an interesting, I mean, move. I think that we shouldn't hold ourselves to that assumption. For example, there's work suggesting a learning trajectory in our capacity to recognize categorical colors. But putting that to one side, it's absolutely accurate to say that the empiricists recognize that the evidence may take us, must take us to a starting place of innateness. I think what I would say is that one lesson of empiricism is a kind of methodological anti-nativism. Let's assume the anti-nativist position and see how far we can go with it. In so doing, we may discover interesting things about the mind works, not just about how learning works, but about the very nature of ideas. It's no accident that the second book of the treatise is where Hume introduces the perceptual grounding hypothesis, because he needs a story to replace the nativist story. Um, so the, there's a sense in which one gets to this particular view about the workings of the mind only after having raised doubts about the nativist alternative. And likewise, in the contemporary context, I think we'll end up with a very different view of what language is. I, I think Chomsky's arguments for innateness are wrong. I think language is not an innate faculty. It's a maverick position, but there's growing evidence in support of it, and the arguments that have been held up as demonstrative proofs have fallen one by one. And I think the resulting theory of the nature of language is going to look very, very different than Chomsky's theory. So the, the payoff in pushing the methodological anti-nativism is we might be led into very different and I think more accurate pictures of what kind of machine we have nested between our ears. Okay. Uh, yeah, I wanted to, uh, to push you on whether you would really be tempted to buy into the Lockean way of ideas in its full glory, mm -hmm. by, by, by which I mean, I mean the, the Lockean way, it's really a way in the sense that it's a single stream through which we go from ideas grasped through sensation, those ideas get put together into sentences, and then, you know, maybe we get operations and demonstrations and inferences on the basis of those sentences that, that all, again, have the building blocks made out of, out of sensations. Now, some of the neat experiments you gave us would fit with that view, but I find that picture of a single stream of cognitive processing rather implausible. Uh, it seems much more plausible to think there's a lot of parallel processing going on, which, and so there's sensory processing, but then there may be other streams that are more linguistic, mm -hmm. and, and that would fit your data too, so that, so that in some of these cases where you give where there's delays or whatever, um, that could just be a certain amount of dissonance caused by, well, there's the sensory stream of processing, and then there's a, another linguistic stream. So the sensory stuff is floating around there and producing these effects, but there's not a single stream in, in the way Locke would, would say. Good. I mean, I think, I, you know, if you, if you read the principles, Barclay says that we sometimes think in language, but it's, it's sort of pseudo-thought. They're just placeholders for real thoughts. We sometimes don't, because it takes time, go through the steps of appending images to those words. And the idea that we can think in language and maybe even acquire certain linguistically based skills and use that as a as kind of an alternative system for thinking strikes me as plausible. I don't think it's incompatible with the Lockean picture. I mean, I think one reason why I chose the, the math example is that's a place where Locke says that language is actually doing some cognitive work. I think Locke underestimated the extent to which language can do cognitive work. Uh, so I think to the extent that this stream picture is is suggested um, by the way he sort of introduces language in the course of the essay, I, I think I, I agree that that may not end up holding up. That said, I think the Lockean way of ideas is compatible with a more flexible view about the nature of, uh, of linguistic thought. Russell, who's you know, in very many ways in his early period a, a traditional empiricist, distinguishes language images and sensory images, says we use both in thought. But in making that move, I think he, he takes himself as tipping his hat uh, to the tradition. Um, so the progression from Locke will increase the role of, of, of language, um, but it won't be, I think, a, a major departure from the resources that he gives us.
Okay, we'll take two more questions. Uh, I'm an anthropologist, and uh, oh, good. I've long been uh, baffled by how the capacity for higher mathematics evolved in the hunter-gatherer environment. I mean, theoretically, we can have uh, somebody, a tribesman, uh, squatting around a campfire in the highlands of New Guinea who was a mathematical genius, but the sum total of mathematical knowledge in his culture is two and more than two. Uh, is this, uh, do you think, uh, is associated with visual spatial skills that uh, would be needed in a hunter-gatherer environment, or what are your thoughts on that? I, I, I mean, I think that, that that's again a place where language may turn out to play an important role. So uh, if you look at variation and in, in success in, the, in that domain, one thing that really seems to lead to greater achievement is having a, a system of symbols for thinking about math. The invention of, of the, the number zero, the numeral zero, had huge ramifications. Uh, you know, Roman, Roman numerals being replaced by Arabic numerals had huge implications for how we do math. If you look at some of the recent cross-cultural uh, psycholinguistic works where you find you know, work in Central America on this group that also only have words for basically one, one and many, you see profound at, um, what we would call deficits in, in numerical performance. So if you just have them do a Simon Says game, repeat that. For us, that's trivial. And we have no phenomenology that suggests we're counting when we do it in, this, in the sense of using numbers. Some, I mean, maybe, maybe we do. But for this, for this group who don't have the word for, that's a very hard task. They're going to make a lot of errors. Now, that's a really striking result. It's a result that says that something that's given to us in the auditory channel that has four def definitely discernible components can't be stored in memory with the exact numerosity. So for approximate math skills, we're pretty good. For exact numerosity, introduction of symbols seems to be a, a, a major cognitive revolution. So I, I think what we develop with, with um, culture in, in symbolic form and others are, are further tools to supplement our, our sensory apparatus. Cross-cultural differences in cognitive achievement usually have to do with the scaffolding that's developed in the form of these external technologies. Language is a major one, but of course, you know, computers and everything else that we use for, for cognition now can be, can be added to that slate. Um, I think He's actually um, just a, a very quick point about the way that you uh, represented imagism, particularly at the very end when you said that the mind should be seen as a, an empty cabinet. I mean, there, there are two things that are going on, or two, two things that you've got to keep in mind when you think about imagism. One is how we think and how we you know, process thoughts or whatever. And the other one is how we store thoughts. And you might have an idea that the way that we consciously represent our thoughts or our concepts are through a kind of combination of different sensory images. But the way that we store them isn't like a series of slides of images or something like that, but it's actually a kind of mental ability to you know, bring things up. And I mean, a anyone, the nativist or the uh, empiricist, is going to need some kind of account of storage that allows for compositionality and uh, cognitive economy. And so, I mean, it's not so much a question as a point about uh, making sure that you try not to think of storage in terms of these images, even when the images are kind of made up of uh, abstract ideals, like in uh, the final picture here. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's right. I mean, there, there are people who read um, Kant as a major opponent of empiricism, and of course he's reacting against empiricism. Certainly the introduction of the categories looks like it's a, a de departure from the Lockean picture in its extreme form. But I think the, the sort of Kantian notion of concepts as, as rules for constructing images is not that far off from, from things that are suggested by some passages in, in Locke. Sometimes, I mean, you know, Locke will say the, the concept is the idea, and the idea is often presented as if it's a, a resemblance of, a representation of the object out there. But he also talks about the, the faculties of the understanding and attention and uh, various uh, operations on these images as very central to our understanding of, of, of the world. So I think a complete picture won't be a snapshot, a file of snapshots, a kind of Rolodex view of the mind. It'll be an interactive view where a, 
a, a set of rules for using these things, for combining these things, becomes part of the story. One of the ways in which we're impaired now is we have within the computational tradition very good models for how to combine symbolic representations. We know how to put words together in a sentence. When it comes to combining pictures together, we, you know, we really don't have very good stories to tell. We know how to do this with paint, but the mind doesn't work with paint. It's not pixels. It's not, you know, the, paint, the components of a painting are little dabs of color. The components of, of mental representations in the visual system are whole contours of objects. And we see Hume talking about, you know, the golden mountain being able to combine these two ideas together. Very suggestive and plausible. But until we have working models of how to do this, um, we're going to be left without a complete theory of thought. So, so I, you know, I, I'd welcome as part of the advance into the sort of neo-empiricist cognitive science real concerted efforts to, to move from a, a, a photo storehouse to something that looks more like what you're describing. Okay, we have seven more questions, but I'm already in trouble, and I'm very, I apologize, but we will have to stop here.